This is Jane Lowe and I'm at SingCon 2024 here in Singapore Orchard Road Hotel. And uh, with me today, I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Dr. Joshua James, who is with the United Nations uh, Office uh, on Drugs and Crime with the Regional Counter Cyber Crime uh, Unit for Southeast Asia and uh, Pacific. So thank you so much for your time today, Joshua. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, so uh, we are going to talk about the highlights of your presentation earlier uh, about um, how the implementation of uh, and economics of cybersecurity uh, is not making cyberspace uh, any safer, and there's a lot more we can do. So, uh, but before we start, if uh, for our audience who are not too familiar with uh, you know, your, your work and your office, could you give a brief introduction about what United Nations on Drugs and Crime do? Sure. So uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, I'm specifically with the Counter Cybercrime Group. Um, we're part of the Global Program on Cybercrime. And we basically help uh, cr the criminal justice systems in um, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Pacific, uh, Africa, Latin America to develop and be able to respond to different types of cyber crimes that are coming up. That's essentially our, our main focus. Right, and uh, uh, as part of your line of work, you also come across uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, sharing of information with various other uh, government agencies and also law enforcement agency. And I think that's also uh, quite a common question for some of our audience. Uh, so how do you work with, for example, uh, the Interpol, for example? Okay. So uh, we do work with, with a lot of different governments. Um, normally, it's in the terms of development and capacity building. So, for example, we work a lot with law enforcement police officers, trying to give police officers the technical skills to be able to respond to cybercrime investigation. Um, sometimes we, we help with what we call the criminal justice aspects of it, um, which could be international cooperation between governments. So if a government needs support of another government to solve a crime that happened internationally, we help make that connection. Mm. Um, so then that way they can start talking to each other. But normally, as the UN, we kind of connect uh, different countries, and right. then we kind of step back and let the countries sort out what they need to sort out. So we're kind of the connector. Right, and of course, your, you your areas of uh, speciality is uh, drugs and cybercrime. And uh, as part of your keynote uh, earlier this morning, you talk about, uh, you highlighted one example, which is scams, which of course in Southeast Asia is, uh, we are seeing a spike since uh, the uh, coronavirus outbreak, right? And it has um, uh, caused a lot of, uh, I guess, in, in the last uh, one year in Singapore, uh, uh, quite quite a lot of damages. And I think um, some of our, the consumers may think, yes, you know, cyber crime, cyber security is definitely, there needs a lot more to be done. But some of us may have also read about some ransomware group takedowns and dark net web uh, takedowns. And there's a cause of optimism, right? But your underlying concern is that uh, we still need uh, to do more to make cyberspace safer. Mm -hmm. Um, I have to say that Singapore, Singapore's response to scams in general, you have the anti-scam center within the Singapore police. It's an amazing response that, mm -hmm. um, first off, has a very quick response time whenever scams are reported. Singapore can actually respond relatively quickly and try to catch, uh, for example, any money that's been transferred before it leaves the country. Mm -hmm. So Singapore is doing extremely well and, and is very forward thinking in the response to things like online scams and a lot of other types of cybercrime. Uh, Singapore also does help a lot with, um, for example, large ransomware cases mm -hmm. or um, these big operations over a long period of time for like dark web takedown. Singapore plays a key role in those mm -hmm. two. So I say Singapore itself is doing excellent and then for big cases, the international cooperation is there. The real challenge though is Singapore can't do it alone, right? Mm. Cybercrime can happen from any country in, in the world, but also any country in Southeast Asia, to and from Singapore almost instantly. Mm -hmm. And no amount of police response is going to be able to respond instantly, mm -hmm. right? So what we really need is not just Singapore responding. We need the capability and capacity of every country in the region and after capability and capacity, a willingness for all of the countries to respond very quickly to each other's requests. Because those requests normally take a long time to make the request formally and then, and then actually get some result from it. So I, I, I can't say, like, Singapore is doing what it can to address the issue, and I think they're doing amazing. Mm -hmm. The real challenge is that we need to get every other country yeah. to that level as mm -hmm. well so then everyone can work together to really solve it. And once we can do that, 
then the financial flows to criminal groups will really go down and it won't be profitable to do these types of crimes anymore. So we need to disrupt the business model, but the only way to do that is to bring everyone else up to kind of Singapore's level actually, right, okay. and in, in terms of the response and the ability to respond quickly. So you talk about the response from a country perspective and also uh, requiring international collaboration and partnerships, right? Um, just uh, want to use the example of the scam again, like from an organizational perspective. And I think um, over the years, uh, it's quite a common well, there's quite a few common challenges for organizations to respond to and, and uh, protect and detect uh, some of these uh, cyber threats. There's a talent burden, so acquiring or retain, re re retaining skills, right? Uh, there's also the techni technical complexity. There's so many security vendors, solutions that you have to integrate. It makes it very difficult to have a holistic picture of what's going on in your organization. There's also the compliance burden, whereby you know there's so many regulations that you have to respond to. So there's a lot of challenges for organizations to, you know, uh, to face and what have you seen in the last uh, you know, few years? Because we have quite a few high-profile cyber incidents, like supply chain attacks, you know, uh, ransomware groups. Have you seen like, organizations uh, responding better? Of course, they have been with all these high-profile incidents over the last few years. Uh, I have to say yes and no. Um, there's more of an awareness among, especially mm. most the, um, let's say, more developed uh, uh, organizations, the, the ones that are at least at more attuned to their risk profile and the things that they need to secure. So there's more of awareness in, in security in general, I think. But you're exactly right about um, uh, compliance and complexity of security, but also that just a lack of, of talent in the space. We need more people mm -hmm. um, in general in the space. So uh, again, like I, like I mentioned in the talk, we're still relatively new at this kind of response because these technologies didn't exist mm -hmm. 10, 20 years ago, right? So organizations are really trying to get a handle around, first off, the talent that they need to come in and then how to respond to that. And with the new technologies, more, uh, can I say, somewhat experimental security technologies are also coming in to try to solve different, different mm -hmm. business problems, right? right yeah. And as they come in, there's going to be complexity. So the, the organizations that are willing to take on that complexity um, will help determine the future of what security looks like because they are essentially the testing ground for these mm -hmm. new companies that are making these new systems, which we need, right? Mm -hmm. And that's essentially going to be a cost of doing business if you want to be on the, the edge of this. Now, the bigger issue I think that we have, again, going back, is a lack of human resources, uh, not only in the private sector, but also in the public mm -hmm. sector. We don't have enough cybercrime investigators or digital forensic That's experts. Right, yeah. And if we train these cybercrime investigators in law enforcement, mm -hmm. they can make a better salary in the private sector so they don't stay. They go mm -hmm. to private sector. So we have a huge retention problem overall. At the same time, criminal groups are using technology to scale their business. So we are not able to scale humans fast enough, mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially, right, but criminal yeah. groups can use these technologies to massively scale their business, and they have, and this is what we're seeing right now. Now, we will respond to it, but it's gonna take time, but in the meantime, people are losing their life savings mm -hmm. because we can't scale fast enough to, mm -hmm. to meet the problem. So you talk about in your talk as well that uh, humans, we need to see them, we need to see ourselves as assets in, in this uh, cyber sort of uh, crime and uh, combating this uh, wave of cyber crime. And a lot of us uh, at cybersecurity conferences, we tend to say that, you know, humans are the weakest link. Right, um, and of course, uh, because that's because, for example, due to phishing or social engineering exercise, and from a user's perspective, when it comes to uh, these kind of scams, there's a lot of uh, new sort of uh, technology and authentication methods that's pushed out by, say, for example, financial institutions, that could be quite challenging for users to catch up with, right? But there's no other choice because sometimes you know the bank is a digital bank. There's no sort of branch that you can go and you know do your transfer, so there is also a catch up. You know, we talk about a cat and mouse game between um, cyber criminals and uh, cyber defenders, but there's also a cat and mouse game between the users and all these uh, organizations pushing out the latest innovations. And you talk about as more that needs to be done in terms of education. Um, I think there's more that needs to be done, not only in education. I think education 
educating people and raising awareness is always a good thing. If you can do that, if mm. you can invest that, it's always it's always worth it because someone will have a change in behavior or be affected. It just depends on how you're approaching them and when you approach them, whether they're going to be more open to it mm. or not. So I am a strong believer in education and awareness programs. Um, even if there's no immediate direct outcome, it's, it's just turning the dial a little bit more and we need to be always turning the dial. So 100% education awareness programs I think are, are worth it uh, in the long run. In terms of what I, what I really think needs to happen though is really this change in mindset about, for example, seeing a user as uh, a liability. Now, of course, there's risk with users because of the social engineering aspect and things like that. They are um, very often the vector that hackers can get into a particular network. So if you're thinking about it from an organizational perspective, you're saying, okay, I don't trust my users because they could be compromised. I totally understand where they're coming from. If we scale out a little bit, though, and you look at national security or security of a government, the people are the assets for that government, right? I mean, that's, that's literally the point of the government is basically to manage and, and hopefully make the lives better of these people. So we can't treat people like a, like a liability whenever you're really looking at the societal or, or overall mm -hmm. level, but we still do. We say, okay, I, I'm a government. I'm going to put all these rules on uh, people, and I'm going to try to control them just like we would in information security, kind of no trust model. Mm. They're going to access resources, but mm, I'm not really going to trust it. If we started seeing people as an asset, and what I mean by that is in information security, we protect assets. We identify the assets that we want to protect the most. We mm. put the most value to the assets, and then that's what we want to protect. When we see users as a liability, that's because we want to protect information mm. in our organization. That's our asset because that's what's going to make us money. And that really comes from the perspective that any user is replaceable, right? So in an organization, okay, this user is mm. not performing. I can fire them. I get a new person. My assets are protected. But if you really see your users as an asset or, more importantly, see citizens mm. in a government as assets, now these are the things that we need to protect. How much should we be investing for that? That's really my point with seeing a user mm -hmm. as an asset. Now, along with your information, because information, no doubt, is, is one valuable. Like, that's how we make good decisions. But we can't just keep seeing everyone as a liability and then excluding them from the calculus of how we're actually going to secure the organization. That's what I meant by asset. So what is the one big change that you think that we governments should do to see, hum or organizations should do to see humans as assets rather than as liabilities? Oh, that's a, I mean, that's a cultural discussion, right? Oh, it is so, a cultural, so, okay. Right, um, right. I mean, it's really the culture that you're, that you're implementing in your, your information security um, mm. systems. If you see everything as an attack on your assets, which a lot of groups do, mm. then what they end up doing is creating controls for people. Um, that way they can protect the things that they can protect. It's also extremely, like I said, centralized mm -hmm. thinking. If we can centralize all of our data and we can protect, kind of put a castle around it, and then we protect everyone from getting access to it. That's really how a lot of organizations and even governments are thinking about their data or their, their assets that they identify. The issue is that um, that centralized way of thinking doesn't really apply to um, uh, societies, right? Because everyone in the country that you're in is distributed, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. We have our own sort of uh, way of thinking, preferences, habits, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and desires and goals, right? That's right, And yeah. although I can't um, necessarily trust 100% that a citizen in this country is going to have the best intentions in mind, right? They might be a risk. But I also can't just immediately treat everyone as a risk mm. because of that. And I think, especially from a defender point of view, we want to block off what we want to protect and then put everything mm. else on the outside and say, I'm going to check. Yeah. But uh, that means no trust at all, mm. right? And that's not how you run a society. Like, if there's no trust, then it's just going to be a breakdown in the society. That's right, yeah. yeah. So we just talked about um, looking at uh, the cybercrime landscape from an organization perspective, from a user's perspective, from a government perspective. Now looking at it from a cybercriminal's perspective, you say that they, some of these are organized crime, they invest a lot in security measures. 
how much do we know about their weaknesses and strengths that we are able to, you know, as cyber defenders, able to sort of take advantage of? I mean, there's there's a lot of different groups working in this space. So, for example, there's there's criminal groups that we would say are not organized. They're just kind of experimenting and they're just trying to get quick cash or whatever, or they're just learning into the systems. So I, I would classify it into kind of unorganized groups or individuals that are trying to just start mm -hmm. doing something, yeah. <laughs> okay? And then organized crime groups that are either new or are older and well-established. The older, well-established groups normally have ties to things like drugs, um, uh, human trafficking. They've already been doing different types of crime, and they're adding cybercrime to their portfolio, right? Because they want to diversify in case one one mm -hmm. revenue stream goes down, basically. So they work like businesses, really. Um, and then there's um, essentially government and nation-state actors mm -hmm. as well. So uh, most governments now, I would say, um, at least are, are having the idea of a cyber military or some sort of um, ability to, to do military operations in cyberspace. And that is really difficult to discern between crime and like military practice. So there's a lot of different groups in the space. Um, I try not to get involved <laughs> in the military side at all because um, that's, that's way beyond uh, uh, what UNRDC does. But really with the organized crime groups especially, um, they have uh, very well established channels, right? And they are so all, are also normally well resourced because of all of the diff because mm -hmm. they're treating it like a business. So they're well resourced. They have the money. They have the infrastructure in place, and they don't want to lose that infrastructure. So they invest a lot in security of that infrastructure, mm -hmm. and they're using exactly the same tools and methods and best practices that we use right, yeah. because that's how you secure things, right? So um, these these criminal groups. Um, are just think of them exactly like a very large business mm. um, and they will do they will invest where they need to invest mm. to make sure that their assets are protected so they view uh, security investments as ROI as well don't of course of course everything mm. is ROI everything mm. is ROI and it's also very cold so they don't they don't necessarily have to care about their employees at all either they care about can this money laundering mm. channel be maintained over the long period like those kind of things so um, yeah, everything is an ROI evaluation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for for the successful organized crime groups. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So um, I'm quite conscious of the time. So my last question, right? Um, what does success look like for you? So we talk about, um, for example, you know, we need to make the cyberspace safer, right? Um, there's a lot of uh, scammers out there, and there's a spike in, you know, all sorts of cyber crime. When, at which point do we say, right, we got it right? Oh, that's <laughs> it's a loaded question. It, it, it's, <laughs> a, it's a little bit of a difficult question. For me, um, and, the, and the work that I specifically do, um, I mean, we've talked a lot about these very large scale um, crimes and, and the ability of technology to help organized criminals scale their business, mm -hmm. right? Um, this, like, as technology develops, we tend to see it developed, it gets abused, and then we have a remedy for that abuse, right? Um, so I think that technology kind of pendulum swift will, uh, pendulum shift will come uh, eventually in terms of some of the technologies, how they're used. Maybe more regulation will come in. Um, different organizations that are involved in this whole process that are non-criminal but are somehow tangently related, they will also need to be either held accountable or somehow shift their thinking um, and how they're willing to support um, some technologies that are being abused, for example. Those things will come. For me and my work that I specifically mm -hmm. do, I go in and I work with the organizations um, uh, that need capability and capacity to respond to different type of cybercrime in mostly developing countries, right? So right now, there's countries that have no ability to do a digital forensic investigation on a phone for even a, a murder case, let, a, let alone a cybercrime, right? So my um, uh, personal goal here for every country in the world is to be able to independently mm -hmm. conduct a cybercrime and digital forensic investigation and be able to extract digital evidence that prosecutors can use in mm -hmm. a court case, and then that goes to court, and then the judge can understand what this actually means and then you can actually have sentencing when something mm -hmm. bad is done. So this 
ability of a country to independently be able to do these investigations, this is my, my mm-hmm. success. The only add-on I would have to that is get a country to be able to independently do investigations and then greatly improve the, the mechanisms and the tools that we have for countries to work together. Mm. Usually that happens through what we call mutual legal assistance, but mutual legal assistance was written pre-internet. Oh, wow, okay. And, and <laughs> right. so it does not, it's not effective for cybercrime. Mm-hmm. We have to revamp the way that we think about and we share information under mutual legal assistance. Mm-hmm. That is 100% necessary. If we can achieve that, mm-hmm. independent investigations in the country, more um, efficient tools for international cooperation through mutual legal assistance, if those two things happen, we could dramatically change the face of cybercrime I can't say overnight because that would take a while, but it would it would dramatically change the way that criminals operate online. Oh wow! Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be uh, very interested in you know having a separate podcast, but obviously not today. Uh, another day on the digital forensic side of things, uh, because I know that you have a. a great experience in that area, right? Um, so you come from the digital forensics uh, um, uh, area. So that will be a fantastic thing to do, you know, over the next, uh, I guess, a uh, couple of years to see how we have progressed in that, or great. rather how you have progressed I, I, in that area. I'm confident, it, it's not me necessarily, it's the countries. Mm. I am confident that that every country in Southeast Asia and the Pacific can make massive improvements in mm. the area. Um, it's just getting them the resources and 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 the. It's mm-hmm. just getting them what they need mm-hmm. to to be able to make that response. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm totally confident that progress is is possible. Right. Okay. I uh, can't wait to do a deep dive into that. Uh, you know, next time. But thank you so much, uh, Joshua, you. for your time today and to give us an overview about you know your work in the UN and uh, how uh, we can help uh, to sort of uh, combat this uh, wave of cybercrime. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you very much.